All right, so let's talk gear. This video is meant as a supplement to all the main builds on the actual professions uh, we'll be getting into very shortly. Maybe you just came from one of those videos and you want to see how to build. So the idea here, as I mentioned at the start of the series, is we're looking at power variants for the open world. They're the most efficient. They'll get the quick kills. They don't overkill because of, you know, their reliance on ramp and so on. So when we're dealing with power builds, what we want is power as a stat. We want crit chance for uh, precision as a stat, and we want our crits to hit hard, so that's ferocity as a stat. So that's three stats we want already, but then you want to mix probably some vitality in there for low uh, vitality classes such as the Elementus, which is what I'm going to be shooting this video on here. Uh, and the other consideration when it comes to open world is you actually want a lot of precision too. So here's the game you're playing, all right? And I'm going to give you guys the tools to make sure your open world builds are always as good as they can be. The main thing that you're going to be pivoting and thinking about as I go through all the different items and things available in the game here is you need to be looking at precision, getting as close to 100% precision without overcapping. 100% crit chance. So anything you spend into crit chance that goes over 100 doesn't really matter because 100% is the same as 150%. You're always going to be critting, right? You want to hit that 100% in a nice, efficient way. And because across the nine professions, there are so many different traits and utility skills and modifiers, it's kind of hard to have a blanket statement. So I'm going to give you guys all the main ways to bump that precision. Uh, a special uh, comment, though. As far as open world is concerned, sometimes it is good to go over 100%. When you go to earlier level zones, like Queensdale, your stats are really aggressively scaled down. So you actually need over 100% to have 100 or, you know, as high as possible when you go down. And maybe if you're spending loads of time here, that's a thing. But these maps are all so ridiculously easy or whatever anyway. We're not going to be worrying about that, okay? We're looking to get to about 100% for level 80. This is also, for what it's worth, what you tend to do in fractals and raids and high-end late-game content. But the difference there is you have the expectation other players are bumping your crit chance up too. Like, if you play with a ranger, the ranger will often have a trait... Uh, that bumps your precision or if you play with a warrior the warrior might drop a banner that's bumping your precision and that kind of messes with the maths we in open world don't get any of that that means we look for precision a lot more heavily so here i'll run you guys exactly what we're going to do uh, i'll pop my hero panel and so this build is not set up here and as you look at my stats you see i've got a good amount of power you'll see that i've got a good amount of ferocity and crit damage here at 229 percent but here's my crit chance this is the number we care about this is the king number okay always get used to where this is in the UI. So you can see I'm only at 57.95. 57 is nowhere near 100. So we want to think about building that up. Now all the builds in this series I give you are probably going to have their own fury. <clears throat> so fury all the time and that's going to mean that you're 20% higher. So what I actually am at, so for example if I give myself a bit of fury you'll see the number turns green. I'm at 77%, okay, because this fury is bumping me up higher, okay. So I'm actually only looking for that last little bit. Uh, on an elementalist, for example, I might add a signal of fire. This passively gives me more crit chance. And now, once I have my fury and stuff on, I'm all the way up at 86% because of the signal of fire. Now, I'm just looking for, you know, a handful of percent, 13.5% left. Uh, and we'll look for that in runes or in sigils or in foods and areas like that. So, as you watch this gear video, <clears throat> I just want you guys to think about building towards that 100%. You just want to make sure that goes there, and once you're comfortable you're around that, you can play around with everything else. For what it's worth, even being around 90% is insanely good, and you really don't have to worry too much for open world. You don't have to min-max that hardcore. I personally feel fine when I'm even around 85%, which you'll see with Fury I'm very close to here. So, just consider that, and that's the main thing you're playing with. In all your own build craft, and as you watch these videos, try and get to 100%. And I'll give you guys all the main ways to bump it up as high as possible. So uh, let's start off actually by looking at stat sets. So when I mouse over my gear, this is all ascended. You don't have to worry about that. It could be exotic. It could even be rare. But here you'll see I'm in Berserker armor, for example. Berserker is well known as a very top end PVE set. Why? Well, yeah, it's a glassy set that doesn't give you much sustain. But in Guild Wars, you can dodge and you're not actually that threatened in the open world. The three attributes themselves combo together and benefit from one another really tightly. And basically, it's the principle that the quicker you kill, and on Berserker you kill very fast, the less chance things have to hit you. So the game, almost paradoxically, can be even easier. So Berserker is very good, even here for our purposes today. 
But when it comes to open world, there's actually a lot of better stuff you can do. For example, Berserker is just three stats. Now, if you pick an attribute combo that is four stats, the four stat combos actually give you more attributes overall. Over your entire build, they actually count for more. They're just less consolidated into one idea. And so some of the four stats are actually really awesome. And that's what I want to show you guys here. So here I have a bit of legendary gear that we can just click customize on. And we can see all the different kinds of um, uh, stats out here. I'm going to run you guys through my favorite for open world. Starting off with what I think is incredible, Marauder. Especially for low vitality characters. So this is four stats. It's power, precision, and ferocity. Just like we saw with Berserker. But there's vitality on there too. I get 670 HP here that I wouldn't have had otherwise. And that's really important. If you look at my health orb here, you'll see I have 15k health, almost 16, instead of the low 11 that I'd otherwise be at. And that means a lot for open world. Especially when you're wandering around and you can find wonky situations where some dynamic events are scaled up really heavy or whatnot. Uh, it's not just the addition of the vitality though. And by the way, if you have a look, you'll see all my trinkets are selected as Marauder Trinkets here. You can actually get like a Marauder Amulet from the Heart of Thorns expansion. So, uh, I kind of like having these set up on my account. What this allows me to do... Hold on, we've got to kill this Scarab. You know, I've been standing here for ages before shooting this video, and no enemy has come anywhere near close to attacking me. And now all of a sudden one has. That's really strange. Um, so, I like to have the Ascended stuff set up on the right-hand side, because I can lift these off of this character, and just put a full Marauder set on anyone I like, right? It doesn't matter what armor class they're on or anything. I just get this that I can translate around. And it's useful for all the builds. So that is something you might like to focus on. Going Marauder on the armor or whatever is kind of nice too. But I like go half Marauder maybe and half something else. Or you can go full Marauder. Again, it's just about getting to that 100%. Um, but the other nice thing, speaking of precision, that Marauder offers over uh, Berserker is, look at this. Berserker would give us 101 precision. But if we look at Marauder, it's 121. They've actually shuffled the stats around. You are taking a hit to your crit damage. But this is not only adding vitality and more stats overall, but it's more weighted to precision. That extra weighting on precision isn't useful at endgame. So most builds you find won't talk about this. But for, uh, well, you know, it's a team-based endgame. But for solo and open world stuff, suddenly that weighting is brilliant. So I really, really like Marauder. It's a big consideration. Along the same lines of just getting more precision, another great set that you can go for is Assassins here. So Assassins is basically Berserker. Power, precision, ferocity. Look at that. It's the same. The difference is the weighting. Berserker weights you on power. So if you're at 100% and you have the power weight, then it's really good. But if you're struggling to get to 100%, Assassins is really good. If you don't mind, if you're, say, a warrior, for example, you've got lots of uh, armor rating and defense value, and you have high vitality, and you have various resustain re mechanics, suddenly Assassins is really nice. You don't care about the vitality, but you get to take all this big damage here too. Uh, I always like Assassins. You tend to find that it's the players running Assassins when you go to, like, big open world uh, events that scaled massively and you don't have anyone really helping you with spotter and banners suddenly it's the people with assassins that are doing the most damage in the game like this is a really really nice set and definitely something to consider another one that i like a lot too if for classes that get lots of crit chance from their traits is the valkyrie set valkyrie is power and ferocity just like berserker but it's no precision at all instead it's just a ton of health okay vitality on there so, why this is good is if you have a class like, say, Necromancer, Reaper, where while in Shroud, you're getting massive numbers of crit chance just from your traits. And you're critting like mad for hitting vulnerable foes. And anyone that can augment like that in a really big way, Guardian is similar with uh, Retaliation, all of a sudden the Valkyrie set is quite nice. And as you watch these videos, keep an eye out for Valkyrie, mixing some of that in. It's basically just free health for you, to a degree, right? So Valkyrie is definitely a nice combo there. The last one I want to mention is actually quite a new one, is Diviner. So this is back to four stat again. Uh, and you'll notice that it says Power, Precision, Ferocity, which is the same as Berserker. Excellent. So we know we're on the right path. But instead, it's a four stat. And the last stat is Concentration this time. And it's, it's one of the weighted stats. So Concentration is Boon Duration. Now, this is really nice 
for a lot of the builds that I'm going to show off. In fact, going half Diviner, half Marauder, or any kind of weird set you like, I would not sneer too much at. This concentration allows you to hold Fury on yourself, allows you to hold really high Might on yourself, because we're aiming for like that juicy 25 Might if we can. Allows you to maintain Alacrity if you're on a class that's doing that, such as Renegade or Chrono can hold that for a little bit longer. Quickness length. This is good, and even it means if you go on good Diviner stuff, you kind of scale up around your allies too, because now any boons you're accidentally splashing out around you increases too. Not that that's that relevant. Like I say, we're mostly solo-oriented here, but sometimes in the open world, you do find other people. Sometimes you'll find your near NPCs and things. So Diviners is a very special shout-out to me. Those are my favorites. So once again, just to run through the list with you all before we move on to the next section, that's Marauder, that's Assassin, that's Valkyrie, Berserker, of course. Um, there's nothing wrong with Berserker. It's just outshone in the open world by some others. And lastly, that's Diviner. Maybe you guys have other comments you'd like. Uh, and you guys can scroll below the video to see other suggestions. But those are definitely the top. And what I would look at for, for mix and matching to get your crit chance as close to 100% as you feel is efficient. So, for the next section of the video, I want to talk about runes and sigils, which will help you get that precision if you want, even higher to the 100% threshold, uh, or you can really play with and have a lot of fun with. So, in my inventory here, I have a list on the left-hand side of all the really badass stuff and fun stuff you can do in the open world. There's actually way more variety in the open world for runes and sigils than I think most people realise, and because we're in an environment where enemies are regularly dying, um, and we get experience, it kind of unlocks this whole side of stuff that you just don't kind of see in raids or isn't that valuable in fractals uh, and other areas. So check this out. Starting off with three of my favorite runes for, for open world. The rune of the ogre, the rune of the privateer, or the rune of the golemancer. So these three runes are all brothers, really, in that they all give you lots of damage. You'll see we get power from ogre and privateer, and we get precision and ferocity from golemancer. But look at their T6s. The T6 of Ogre is 4% damage always, which is good, very strong, but also summons a rock dog while in combat. For Privateer, it's we shout Yar when we go in combat, which summons a parrot and gives might to allies. So the parrot gets summoned and we give it might at the same time. Uh, and then lastly, we have the Golemancer, which is Ferocity on the T6, but also summon a Golem in combat. So all three of these are summon runes. There's, there's some others out there like Lich runes. They're not so good. These are the really good ones, okay? Because all the stats you get from them are incredible. But you get an ally. Now, I know what some of you guys are thinking. Is that really that good? It is that good. Here's the thing in the open world. When you're running around with an ally, it's like you become like a bare bow ranger, okay? Which are notorious because the way that AI works in Guild Wars 2 is mostly it will just attack whatever's close to it. So if I attack this scarab, I would summon a rock dog if I was on these runes. It would run in... And I wouldn't be getting hit at all. At all. And it really eases a ton of pressure off of your build. Obviously in high AoE scenarios where there's entire groups of enemies that we're dealing with. Suddenly your minion friend doesn't help that much. But these runes actually went through a rework this year. That means you permanently have that ally. Every 60 seconds it refreshes unless it manages to die. But just that aggro shaking, that all in its own means a ton. It means that you have so much more comfort and ease of life in the open world. You'll be astounded at how much easier everything is, even in story missions, just from having these. Seriously. Um, let's remind ourselves, Guild Wars 2 is a game where you can actually AFK beat the core story and travel through the open world just being a ranger with a pet. And it's mostly because of that aggro shaking. And this is what you get on any class for these. So I've actually organized these. Ogre has the best like stat combo, like power and ferocity and damage. That's amazing. If you're still looking for precision, maybe you don't like this one so much. But this is really good. Really good. But the pet itself does the lowest damage. This pet does about 300 damage a second. And when it gets low, it tries to run away. So that's not so good. This pet hits harder. It's a bird. It attacks more rapidly. It goes all the way up to 400. Um, but you might not like the stats so much. Might duration is still very good though. And then finally, the Golemancer. This is actually a dungeon rune. The golem does the most damage. It's like another 100 up again. I think it's like 500 damage a second or 600 damage a second. Um, and this one actually has precision on it too uh, with lots of ferocity. So since the rune overhaul in particular, these are all really good. And you can just kind of pick which one you like, you know, which ones sound fun and go for it. I will say about the golem, he's kind of erratic with the way his animations work. So he's better against very stationary stuff. I think in practice, probably the bird does the most damage. Because, like, as, as enemies move, it can keep up kind of thing. 
Uh, though the other thing I would say about this is it might be the squishiest too. Anyway, they're really fun and do not overlook the summon runes. They are absolute musts in my opinion. Next, we have two runes. Again, brothers. And what we're looking at here is the... Uh, uh, power sets on both of them. Boon duration on both of them. Boon duration is excellent, guys. Again, it keeps quickness and fury and might up. But the T6s on these uh, are quite curious. Gain movement speed. 25% movement speed on fireworks. And then with both of them, while you're in combat, you'll just continue refreshing boons on yourself. Okay? So for pack, check it out. We get five stacks of might introducing the fight, fury, and swiftness. Just for free. We don't need to spend any traits or utilities or anything. We just get that. And every 30 seconds it refreshes. Over here, for fireworks, we get Might, Fury, and Vigor. And in some ways, Vigor is even better than Swiftness. This one's even on a lower cooldown. So fireworks runes are really new. They're actually my preferred of the two. Uh, what's really cool about these as well is the movement speed. Obviously, you're mounting a lot in the game now, and the movement speed doesn't mean too much. But you compare, like, fireworks to some of the classic 25% move speed things, and it's crazy. This is just so, so, so strong. Really fun, and they're new as well, so that's one of the reasons I quite enjoy these. There are some nice synergies on these as well, if you're any kind of class that plays on Fury. So, like, Revenant. Revenant gets so much value out of Fury, and Renegade too. But, so, now you're pulsing this, and it means you're getting more might, and you're just doing all these delicious things. So, Pack uh, is very, very, very good, particularly when paired with Rev, in my opinion. So you can pick these two runes. Another two, another row of runes, sorry. This row here that are pretty fun. These are kind of all just big damage, right? There's not much flavor or fun with them, but they're all very good. So you've got Eagle. This is a great precision set if you're still looking for precision. And it's 10% damage straight up once your target hits below 50% health. So that's pretty good, all right? The only downside to Eagle in the open world is that... The amount of time you're in the fight, the amount of hits you do to an enemy while it's below 50% tends to be less than the number of hits you do to an enemy while it's above 50%. And that's because you'll have more might and stuff once the fight is rolling. But also, there's like overkill, right? So I could do a big hit, but not even much of it counts. Or I could do a big multi hit and not much counts. So, Eagle, like, the majority of the fight, you're not getting the T6. That's what I'm trying to explain. And it's towards the part of the fight that would end quickly. Anyway, you then get the T6, right? It's pretty minor. You don't have to think too deeply about it. It's a very solid rune, though. Similar is Rune of the Thief. So, precision. The Condi damage is okay-ish, but really not that good. But here, this is just 10% always, as long as you're behind or to the side of the foe, what they call flanking. So, I love Thief. I like Thief because it's actually kind of a playstyle thing. When I'm on Thief runes in the open world, I actually have a little bit more fun kind of actually trying to stay to the side of a guy and not letting him turn during his animations. And then you can be sure to get the, the buff the whole time. That also kind of means that, you know, you don't feel too bad once class is running weird skills like this, right? Because now this will take the aggro and then you can get to the side or, you know, stunning someone and moving to the side. It's just fun gameplay and it's a strong rune. Lots of damage on there. A good precision rounder as well. Next, you've got these two. So there's Ranger and Flame Legion. You guys can pause the video to see all the stuff, but we've got precision on this one and Ferocity once again. Or you've got power here. But this is 7% always as long as you have an active companion. So this is obviously very good for Ranger or if you're using any kind of minion or whatever on any build. This used to work on mini pets, but it doesn't anymore. So don't get too excited. And then we have Flame Legion, which is uh, increased damage when they're burning. So that's harder to get on some classes. But on other classes, burn up time is really easy to come by. Even on this profession, burn up time is really easy to come by. And here's the funny thing. The uh, other bonus on this is it makes your burns last 50% longer. Burns, if there's any Condi you care about in the open world, but uh, damaging Condi, burn is one of them. And why is that? Burn has high base damage on it, okay? And once you get some might rolling, so here I'll pop like fill the burn. The burn that we deliver is actually not bad. So having 50% duration there, does mean something. Don't be duped and think, oh, that's just Condi. It's not good. It is good. Flame Legion's a really solid choice. Then finally, you have the King. This is ran, you know, all over the place. Scholar. This is just the most damage you can get out of a rune. There is no precision on it. You have to deal with precision purely everywhere else. But it's a, co a consideration for you if you like. They even kind of buffed it this year, which means that when you start getting low on health, it doesn't even punish you that much. So there you go. That's like just straight up damage. The last two runes that I want to talk about are about Boon Bounce. There's one to do with Might Bounce, and there's another one, or Duration, sorry, and then there's another one to do with Fury. So, the Rune of Strength allows you to do lots of damage, but also allows your Might to stick on. So, 25 Might is huge. It's really important. Think about this, guys. 
just a couple of might and you've already gained 100 power, all right? So the more you can keep super high might on you, the better. Strength is really good. It's even better when it when you combo it with certain foods and sigils that we're going to get to in the next sections, okay? So keep strength in mind in a moment. But it's just massive might duration. It's a good rune set still. And overall, if you're playing into might and you really are keenly at that 25 might during all these builds, it's going to be, be uh, it's better than if you were low might but on scholar, right? So it's very, very, very important that you get that might for yourself. That means that this one shines. A lot of people overlook it these days for an open world option. And then there's kind of an alternate. This one's much more fringe, to be honest with you. It's uh, it's the same deal, but for Fury. Uh, the thing is here that you're going to get a lot of Fury from other classes, uh, from other areas of your class. But this is like permanent Fury. Look at that T4. Gain Fury for 8 seconds when you enter combat. Cool down 10 seconds. So it's just infinite fury, really. And you do 5% damage while you're under fury. And you get lots of ferocity. Don't overlook rage if uh, fury is the downtime. But I think for all the builds I'll be showing, largely that shouldn't be much of a problem. But it's fun. All these runes are really cool. And I uh, wholeheartedly recommend the lot of them. Next, let's take a look at sigils. So I've got a wide range of sigils here. Uh, some of them are really flavorful and fun. Despite the fact that there's this little bulk here, there's actually a lot more that are possible. Each of these rows could be expanded massively, and I'll show you what I mean by that in just a second. So starting off with the top row, let's just look at pure stats, and let's just look about rounding our build out. So first of all, you've got the Sigil of Force. This is 5% damage always. It's a strong Sigil. It's actually not very high on my recommendation list uh, for Open World, because so often you really do want to be looking at Might or some other baseline perk. Uh, that the 5% damage is overshadowed by other stuff, alright? So I do not recommend this as high, but we already showed Scholar before, so there it is anyway. It diminish, it drops off in its value in open world. Uh, next we have the Sigil of Accuracy. So this is like uh, Force. Force is that's just straight up damage, power. This one is straight up crit chance. So this is another 7%. This is a really good option for pulling your crit chance up to that higher level and is very, very often worth worth running. It depends on what your particular mix is, how heavy you are on assassins and stuff. But don't overlook Sigil uh, of Accuracy if you really need it. And the last straight stats one is the Sigil of the Knight. So the Sigil of the Knight is exactly like Force, except twice as good. Force is 5% damage. Knight is 10% damage while it's dark outside. So, we don't often see people run this in uh, endgame these days. It used to be very good in dungeons, because a lot of dungeons were technically at night. But a lot of the raids and fractals, they don't really allow you to play into the sigil. When it comes to open world, if you see it's nighttime interior, you should definitely just throw a weapon on that's got the sigil of night, because it is worth so, so, so much. I still really love this sigil. I think a lot of people overlook it. It had a buff this year as well, which means that even when it's day, you still get a 3% modifier. But what I would prefer people do is, you know, have just a spare nighttime weapon. And hey, that allows you to play with more fashion wars, right? You can have, you know, a night nighttime looking uh, sword skin, and then you can have your daytime one with a different sigil on it. Don't forget about Sigil of Night. Staple of the old dungeon days, it's still there, it's still good. So these were just like flat stats. Now let's talk about stacking sigils. So these you just don't see anywhere. Like with raids, there's not enough kills going through. With fractals, the islands don't last long enough and you're prone to go, you know, dipping into the downstate and losing them, so it's whatever. But Open World loves these. So you've got the superior sigil of bloodlust. Gain extra power every time you kill a foe. And it will go all the way up to 25. So this is 250 power for you. You're going to run around in the open world. And it means you just kill someone, you start ramping. You kill someone, you start ramping. I actually really like the gameplay that comes from these. I think they're really fun. Uh, not only is there just straight up power on Bloodlust. But if you're looking for more crit chance, you can give yourself 250 precision from this one that you ramp into. And then finally, a special shout out to this new one. The Sigil, or new-ish, the Sigil of the Stars. So, if you look here, you get 10 power from Bloodlust, okay? You only get plus 2 from Sigil of the Stars, but that's plus 2 to all stats. And the devs actually did a recent patch where they made it so that things that affect all stats actually include a couple that they never used to. I believe Expertise was rolled in recently and Concentration. So, overall, it's actually more stats, all right? Because you're getting every single attribute at plus 2. And you, know, you only need to hit 5 attributes for it to be of equal value. So the most stats you can get, you would actually go stars. Stars, you don't really feel the impact of much because you know, you're know you gonna get some fairly useless 
things, you know, a couple of percent extra uh, condition duration or whatnot. But sometimes that's enough, just enough to make a break bar tick over because it kept the weakness on there just that little bit longer. And you never know. So anyway, City of the Stars is just kind of a fun one that I thought I'd point out. But these are really cool and I love the gameplay with them. You want to be careful about going downstate with these though because it does remove it. In the olden days, you used to be able to put them on underwater weapons, stack underwater, and then have the buff above ground. That's not in there, and since then, I think uh, it's kind of fallen out of favor, but they're still good. Next, we have uh, Air and Fire. So, you remember we were talking about Force, 5% damage? Air and Fire are really good, and you can kind of think of them like Force. So, this is just, as you strike someone, ev as you hit someone, every three seconds, a lightning bolt will come down. Now, that lightning bolt hits pretty hard. It's okay, all right? And then every three seconds, this is another lightning bolt, lightning bolt, lightning bolt. It just keeps going. That's it. It's as simple as that. You just think of it as a flat damage buff, but kind of a more flavorful, visual thing than, say, force. Here's the thing. Air is, like, the main thing people recommend when it comes to killing big bosses and stuff, or classically was. But in the open world, fire is actually my preferred choice. So fire only resets every five seconds not every three it's every five now but which means sometimes you'll like miss the window the enemy will die before it procs again when air might have or something but this one's aoe and it's 240 radius 240 radius is not bad so it's now a flame strike that comes down and if you actually look at the difference in power between these two sigil of air is only slightly more damage it's a tiny little bit more damage yet this one's aoe and the AoE is really good, guys. Imagine you're a thief and you're on the signet that gives you extra health every time you hit someone. Fire's now procced it five times. Imagine you're trying to build, like, CA on a druid or something. Just hitting people more often has trait synergies and is just better. And, you know, you're hitting people for more damage. You're often outnumbered and their fire is better. So fire is actually my preferred and I still enjoy this one. There's so many sigils I like, man. I mean, all of these are things I like. So, yeah, it's kind of, you know, you could have an account filled with 10 characters each playing with different things. It's so cool. Uh, next, we've got Strength and Frenzy. So, these are kind of specials. Remember what I said about Strength runes? Lots of might? Well, I introduce you now to the Strength sigil. This one's actually fairly expensive and for good reason because it's insanely good. Look at this. Gain might for 10 seconds when you critically hit a foe. Well, hold on. We're going for 100% crit chance, and it's very possible to have 100% crit chance. So, we are just constantly gaining might, okay? Now, the might lasts for 10 seconds, and you can only gain one might every second. So, that means you can get a maximum of 10 might out of this, right? Running around with plus 10 might is already really good. That's excellent. You know, 25 is the cap, and now, just from one sigil... There's nothing else, no traits, anything else. Just from one sigil, you've got a bedrock of 10 might that you're running around on, should the fight last 10 seconds. That's super good. But even better, boon duration would bump that up. Remember this guy? So now the sigil is giving you even more if you play into that. Or, or By the way, this is not the only might duration, right? These, uh, like, fireworks and pack also do this. So this combo of strength plus these two... That really, if you think you're not getting to the 25 might, just these alone, they will really help you. That's why it's an expensive sigil, and it's for very good reason. I love it. Then also, for fun, uh, and one of the builds that uh, I'm actually going to be showing you looks at this uh, very closely very soon, the Sigil of Frenzy. So this is actually a new Path of Fire for, uh, sigil. Uh, recharge all of your equipped skills by two seconds upon killing an enemy. At least I think this was Path of Fire. So this actually used to give you alacrity. But what it means is you just kill someone every 10 seconds and all of your cooldowns just bulk chunk down. That has some synergies on uh, builds that have lots of quick activating skills and you just want to get back to them very fast. We'll look at this very detailed on Ellie, but it's fun for anything. It's really fun for anything. The cooldown of 10 seconds, what you can really think of like is you get it every time you engage, right? So you're going to kill something, get the proc. And then about 10 seconds later, you'll be re-engaging something else and you'll get the proc again. 10 is a nice sweet spot. It might, it, it looks worse on paper than it is just because of the pace of how you rotate through enemies in the open world. Finally, for the sigils, we have Wrath, Justice, and so on and on and on and on. What are these sigils? Well, they're like Night, okay? Night is 10% damage when it's dark out. These are 10% damage against specific enemies. So I just wanted to give a little shout out to these because they are good. So like this is Wrath is Sons of Svarnir slaying. Might be interesting for the Ice Brood Saga. We've got uh, Justice, which is Bandit slaying. Uh, and, you know, so many different enemies out there. This is something that would be really good if you run build templates. Either the native ones that will be coming into the game. Or, uh, you know, a third party solution for build, build templates. You just swap them around. 
And that's kind of one of my favorite things in RPGs is that sense of preparing for an encounter and really setting stuff up. And this is Guild Wars' version of that. You could go knight and one of these and you're on a 20% modifier just from sigils. Best be on a build that's given itself a ton of might already. But there you go. So that's all of the most relevant sigils. If you guys can think of another one, let me know. Next, we're going to look at food and nourishments. Again, much like with runes and sigils, you can do a lot of stuff in the open world you wouldn't find elsewhere. So let's talk about it. First of all, now that Ascended Cooking is in the game, one of the best things you can do when you log on is instead of spending your own food, is to go to the Lion's Arch Aerodrome or to go to Lion's Arch and look for plates or feasts of Ascended food that are on the ground. If you can find one, you will have the top stat food in the game for free and even better, if you have metabolic primers or utility primers, and remember, if you do gardening in your home instance, you can get other versions of these that aren't quite as potent, but they're very good still. You can eat a primer, then go get your ascended food, and it will last your character all day of playing. You know, it will last 12 hours, or it will last all day and tomorrow. Those ascended foods are great, not just because of their stats, but also because they give you karma and gold and so on, extra, uh, you know, magic find. The thing I would recommend for those is anything that gives you power, ferocity, the perk on top, life steal on crit is very good. So whenever you critically hit, you do a little bit of extra damage and you resustain yourself. Remember, resustain re -sustain is important to us. Or minus 10% damage is pretty good as well. So that's the first thing I'd recommend. Um, so, you know, like, look for the ascended version of a bowl of sweet and spicy butternut squash. Uh, uh, foods like this as well, by the way, top tier raiding meta and fractal meta bit, uh, foods, as long as your precision is correct, go for it. Do whatever you like, right? So you can run these. And I've just got one as a representation here. But let's talk about fun things you can do in the open world. Other stuff. Let's say you can't find any ascended food. You want to start your own control over your own destiny. What do you want to do? Well, here we have them. And there's a lot of budget foods here that people just don't think about. First of all, I've got the Omnom Berry Bar and the Peppermint Omnom Berry Bar. So this is Magic Find. 40% Gold Find from Monsters. This is what we classically used to use in COF and so on. And extra experience from kills. You don't actually get any combat stats from this. But it's something nice to, you know, buff your rewards. Again, look for the Ascended Foods if you can. Uh, in addition to that, though, there's actually the Peppermint version, which uh, is much cheaper on the TP and gives you more stuff. The difference here is that you're getting Karma on top, too. So if you're going to go for one, probably go for Peppermint. But the classic was the Omnom Berry Bar, of course. I had to show off. Uh, so we'll move that to left. I'm not really recommending that. Let's do this one. Uh, next, though, let's check this out. Remember when we were looking at Sigil of the Stars? Well, Dragon's Reverie st Star Cake. 45 to all attributes and magic find. It's not a bad open world food. Cheap. Good to go for. Next, we have two very strong ones here. There's the Dragon's Breath Bun and the Steamed Red Dumpling. So let's do the Dragon's Breath Bun first. This is 200 power for 30 seconds whenever you score a kill. And it's 70 ferocity always. This is also a part of a festival, which means that they're not actually that expensive to go for. So this is a big recommendation for me. Again, the duration, you can bump up with a, a primer or whatever. But here's what's so good about that. You're in the open world. What procs this is getting experience from a kill, right? So as I run around here, if I kill this veteran scarab, the next scarab I go for, I'm way stronger. And you can basically, there's no cooldown on this buff, okay? So you can just run around with permanent plus 200 power and a ton of ferocity. It's excellent. That's like to the level that the scribing buffs give you, all right? The horrendously expensive scribing buffs that you can easily lose because you take a little bit of damage. Dragon's Breath Bun is possibly my favorite open world food in the entire game. Its brother does a similar thing here, 200 power for 30 seconds on kill. But here, instead of ferocity, we get 140 condition damage. So we get double condition damage, and that's also on kill, plus magic find during Lunar New Year. But so this one just gives you both really damaging uh, attributes on kills. And you actually get more stats from this one. The thing is that this one's condition damage. Uh, and so, you know, that's less valuable to you. Unless, again, there's very a lot of burn and sort of hybrid approach on your build, which I'm not going to be recommending so much. So my bigger recommendation is Dragon's Breath Bun, but this one's really fun too. And don't be put off by the, the, the rare text on the uh, rarity there. It's just as accessible as the buns. Next, we have three similar... Um, foods down here there's winterberry pie there's all space all spice cake and then all spice cake with ice cream so all of these are life steal check this out 66 percent chance to steal life on critical hit 
This is what you really should be going for with the ascended foods, in my opinion. So, this just gives you lots of... Think of them like mini sigils of air that are just constantly proccing and resustaining you. Making you feel like you have a mini signet on you too. It deals with both things we care about. Getting pressure out and resustaining ourselves. So, the winterberry pie is the best one. This you're actually going to get from Bitter Frost Frontier and getting the recipe there. But it's very accessible. Uh, this one, I think you can buy on the TP... No, you can't. Th these two are weird. They're account bound, so you have to chef them yourself. They're not that expensive, or oh, this one here, which is power and lifesteal. But this one's kind of is for condition damage and lifesteal. And it's basically adding ice cream to the cake. But that means that this costs the cake and the ice cream. And all you're doing is swapping the power for the condition damage. So this is weird. If you really care about Condi for an open world build, you can look at this. But I'm not recommending this one so much. Go for the allspice cake, or even better, the winterberry pie. Or even better, the ascended foods. Next, we have Golden Dumplings, and we also have Ghost Pepper Popper. So these are like your might generations. Remember, we already talked about how much might you can get from a Sigil and a Rune. Now let's look at this. Fried Golden Dumpling. 100 concentration, so that's boon duration, so your might is lasting longer. And a 33% chance to gain might on critical hit. Now there's no ICD listed here, but I think there is one. But basically, this is just even more might that you keep rolling in. Your bedrock of might now is absurdly high doesn't matter what you're playing in the entire game. It doesn't matter what profession or elite specialization. You take the correct combo of these. Strength, strength, dumpling. you got tons of it. Okay? Um, probably overkill at this point. So, you know, you don't have to go for all three a lot of the time. But, yeah. Another version of this as well is the Ghost Pepper Popper. Which is during the day, give yourself my 40% on a crit. Okay? Or during the night, you chill. This one's actually a little bit better. The chance to gain might is higher. On the dumpling, it's just 33. On this one, it's 40. But it then kind of disables in a sort of half disables at night. But even at night, this is good because it's chill. So if I was playing a warrior and I was running this, I'm now applying chill to my targets as I strike them. Just free. And my class wouldn't normally have that. Now, why is that good, you might think? Chill isn't, you know, that amazing. Uh, but it actually is. In the world of break bars... Now, just from doing your regular damage, you're degenerating people's break bar. Because that chill is up there, and then it's comboing with what other conditions you're throwing out. Like the incapacitating ones. So this is actually really good as well, just in a different way at night. Then you've got classes like Reaper that get deeper synergies with it. So really think about this. The final food I want to talk about is a fun Path of Fire one. This is the Cup of Light Roasted Coffee. Now, I just want to say, if you do any PvP or World vs. World... The reward tracks for the most recent expansion content all give you tons of this. They give you boxes where you can drop feasts of them everywhere. I've got like stacks of feasts. I don't just drink coffee for myself in Guild Wars. I drop these pots everywhere I go and other players can drink it for free. All right? I am the coffee master. Now what's fun about it is this. The way we kind of play the game is we kill something like that scarab. And if we're trying to be really quick, we get on a raptor. Or whatever man we like. Then we move in. We do our engage ability to CC. And then we kill the next guy. Okay. And we'll proc our frenzy sit or whatever. And then we'll mount again. And we'll go again. Now what this has really good combo with is coffee. Coffee is gain 5 seconds of quickness on dismount. So we care a lot about quickness. Quickness is amazing. What it means is when I engage on the target as they're crowd controlled. By my raptor leap or the springer jump or whatever it is. A lot of them will crowd control. While they're in that state and I'm blowing them up, you saw I opened up with Warhorn 5 here and did just crazy damage. I also have quickness during that period, right? Where my big burst is on the CC'd guy. So that is so good, all right? And uh, it's got a 20 second cooldown, which is the only kind of downside to it. It's got 70 precision on it, but you're keeping lots of quickness. A lot of classes struggle to find their own uh, quickness, and now you can fix at least partly that. With your food. On a uh, Tempest, I actually particularly recommend this because you can uh, swap to Earth on a Warhorn and you can Sand Squall after you've dismounted and now you've lengthened the duration of your quickness, right? And it's going on even further. There are a couple of other interactions like that across the game. But so that's something you can think about too. After consumables, there are of course uh, enhancements. So you've got nourishments up here and enhancements down below. There's a bit less to talk about here, but uh, I will give you guys the best uh, in my estimation. Uh, I wouldn't worry about getting precision from these, personally. Try to figure it out elsewhere. And here's what I'd say. First of all, for nourishments, you have slaying nourishments. Again, it's a lot like when we recommended with sigils. Uh, if you know specifically what enemy you're going against, it's really nice to have these. These days, there's account inventory slots. 
And you could realistically it, uh, fill up all these slots. If you anticipate doing a lot of open world uh, with various kinds of potions and just have fun. No matter what character you're on, you've got the potion available. You can go for it. Players with bank access expresses can do that. But, you know, there's very few of those. Uh, anyway, it's a nice idea. A good general thing to go for, though, is a furious sharpening stone. So these you actually craft for yourself. But what they do is they give you power and they give you ferocity based on how much crit chance you have or how much precision you have. So if you've taken a sigil or a signet that's given you crit chance, that's not the same as precision. What you want to get built is lots of high precision from like gear, from like marauders stats or from um, assassin stats, right? And then they just bump up your straight up damage uh, beyond that. Uh, they give you power and they give you ferocity. These are really nice. Failing this, if you don't want to craft these for yourself, there is the super generic superior sharpening stone. You get them on the trading post and this doesn't give you ferocity. So this one gives you power and ferocity in exchange for precision. This one just gives you power. Okay, uh, but it's a lot of power. So these are very nice. They're, you know, easiest access. So go for these. And then lastly, just if you're on a bit more of a budget, uh, there's actually the Ogre Sharpening Stone too, which is exactly the same as the Superior one, but it lasts longer and I think is a little bit more efficient to uh, craft for yourself in terms of economy and stuff. So yeah, these are just what I'd recommend here. Nothing too special. The next row is very fun though. This is the Sharpening Skull. So this is a enhancement that does nothing for you okay but they're quite cheap to buy and when you proc them they're really good so look read this reviving an ally grants the feline fury to both you and the revived ally feline fury increases all your attributes by a small amount so uh, I think this is the version that gives you basically Zerk stats. It's going to give you like power and precision and frosty. It's going to bump you up a significant amount more than any of these. It's going to give you loads of stats. But the only way to trigger it is by reviving someone. So uh, what's kind of fun to do, and you might think that's really rare, right? You're playing solo. But as you wander around the open world, what's kind of fun is just looking out for dead bodies. <laughs> um, and you can res them. You just hand res any kind of NPC. And all of a sudden, you can get value off of that NPC. Because he gets the buff, but so do you. And you can walk around for the next little while with it. When you end up finding yourself, say you're in Heart of Thorns. Suddenly, you've been doing a part of a meta and it's exploded in some big event. Well, now there's a ton of players around. And you can uh, get value off of it constantly. And you're buffing them. You, an ally who you've just rezzed might have one of these stones on. And you've just given them the buff. In fact, you can trigger the buff and then re-equip your regular. But, of course, that would cost a lot of money. So, maybe don't do that too much. So, that's pretty nice. Lastly, there is an item from a dynamic event here called Scale Venom. This is a classic item. It used to actually not technically be classed as an enhancement. But, nowadays, it is. So, you can only have one of these. You can't overlap, right? But, this is Scale Venom. You buy this from an event. I have a video on this on my channel. Quite an old one. Uh, by doing an event at the start of this bridge here. So you come to the Bloodfin Lake. There's some char standing here. And they run in a patrol. And they end here. Okay. You follow them in the dynamic event. And once this finishes. You're killing scale. You can buy from the NPC. Uh, this scale venom. And it says. While attacking. You have a 10% chance to inflict weakness. And vulnerability. That lasts for 5 seconds. When you hit a foe. So that might not sound that fun. You might think, oh, power is better or whatever. But actually, this is very good. The rate at which packets of damage come out in the game now is so fast that even at 10%, you're going to proc this very regularly. And when you proc it, weakness is amazing for your self-sustain. It really inhibits the enemy's ability to hit you. Uh, but further, it's amazing break bar drain. So, once again, it's kind of like I said about the uh, Ghost Pepper Popper. You just do your regular thing, and now you're spamming weakness out, okay? And that means the break bars are just draining before your eyes without you having to worry very much. And that's a big part of people getting quick kills. Remember, you break a break bar, the enemy becomes vulnerable, it can't attack you back, you get time for your heal skill to return. Breaking break bars regularly is massive. And a lot of open world players don't do it, but they can just do it by eating the right foods and taking the right nourishment. So I love this combo of nighttime ghost pepper popper plus a scale venom. And it procs a lot more regularly than you'd think. There are some weird bugs with this. Uh, like apparently if you use bouncing skills with a scale venom, it will sometimes proc on you. And that's awful. So be very careful about that. If you see while drinking this, you are weakening yourself and vulnerability yourself. 
Well, that's kind of lame. You want to be careful. By the way, the Vuln isn't too bad either. Some classes have insane Vuln, and all my builds are going to be looking to give you lots of vulnerability. But the Vuln isn't too shabby either. So this one's really good. Don't overlook it. They don't last long, only 10 minutes. So make sure when you do the event, you buy a ton of them. Luckily, they're very cheap according to today's standards of gold inflation. So you'll be fine. One final section to do is something a lot of you guys can skip. But I do want to give some honorable mentions to tools. This is a category I'm calling these. So they're not foods, they're not sigils, runes, enhancements. But there are a certain type of item you can activate in the open world that will benefit you massively. These are items that are disabled in PvP and disabled in world versus world and disabled in raiding. But for story and open world, they're excellent. And I think a lot of veteran players particularly kind of forget to utilize much of this stuff. Some fractal players will utilize it because they're available there. But in general, people overlook it. If you're a new player, don't be scared to pop this stuff. Don't think, oh, I'll save it for something more important later. Because the important stuff later, it tends to be disabled. So have fun. The first row, I want to look at combat boosters. So you will get these occasionally from gems, from achievement rewards, from quest rewards and level rewards as you play through the game. There's strength boosters in the game, which give you 5% more damage that stacks on top of everything else. There's speed boosters, which you can kind of ignore, to be honest, it's nothing. It's 15% movement and you can easily get so much more movement. Uh, there are and mounts as well. There's armor boosters, which reduce your damage and rejuvenation. Of all of these, the rejuvenation ones I actually think are the strongest. These help you to stay healthy way more than the extra damage and stuff from these will do, or the damage reduction here. This just keeps popping on you, especially if you're going for something like Scholar Runes, or you have traits that mean, like the Engineer's trait, Glass Cannon, do more damage at high health. Rejuvenation boosters are awesome. Don't be scared to use these. There is no point saving these up for years and years and years thinking, oh, I'll do it later. The, the best time to use it is open world and is the story because that's one of the only places it will be relevant anyway. Like I would pop these in the Balthazar boss fight or the Morgamoth boss fight or whatever moments you like in the uh, story. So uh, do consider them. I'm, what I'm actually currently showing you right now is a discontinued item, this uh, enchanted combat boost, I think. I think it's discontinued. Uh, but, you know, you can get the actual individual boosters as well. The other thing is revive orbs. When you die, you can res yourself and just keep fighting. This is useful in so many places. Don't forget about them. Don't be scared to use them. I actually keep these in my account inventory slots all the time. Moving on, we've got some held items. So these are all gathered from various areas around Tyria. I have videos on them already. But you've got the experimental rifle and the experimental teleportation gun. So the rifle is what I really care about here. This helps you to navigate the environment. You can activate it. You give yourself a rifle, even if you're an older rifle wielding class. And the skill two is like jump shot. It's called shadow leap. But basically, it's a 900 range jump ability. Stealths you where you land. But that means you can jump across various chasms and ledges and things your class otherwise might not have been able to. It has a 50% chance of backfiring and it will blow up in your face and knock you back. So make sure you give yourself stability before casting it. But it's good for navigating the environment. Another fun one as well is the teleportation gun, which does something very similar. Has no fail rate, but also creates a portal that you and your allies can go through. Kind of overshadowed by the zero portal these days, which is also very good and you could include on this list. But this one's pretty easy for everyone, even if you're not a raider. Uh, next, I have these three items, the metal rod, the wooden plank, and the rock. These are available all as one big bulk purchase in Dredgehaunt Cliffs. I think you finish, uh, yeah, I think it's Dredgehaunt anyway. You finish a, uh, a dynamic event somewhere around here at a house. I think it might be here that you buy them, and they're all available. Um, and what these are are big CCs. So the metal rod has this skill too, which is an epic CC, like breaks the break bars super quick. We have the wooden plank which has the skill 2. If you're a warrior, I think you get an even stronger uh, skill here as well, which is a massive break bar uh, hit. And you have a rock, which is a ranged break bar hit. Fractal players use these all the time, uh, but they're available in the open world too. So if you are really struggling to get that break bar down, you can utilize these. Don't forget with mounts, right? Like I can pick this up. I'm in combat for some reason. I don't know what with. But I could mount right now and I would keep my bar. When I dismount, I drink. I have my coffee and I could just quickness hard CC someone. Again, two times in a row. And then do whatever else, right? So these are really good. And they're just something uh, that you might want to consider. Then we have three stealth items. You've got the Order of Whisper Spy Kit. Again, I have videos on where to get these, like the full events. This one's from Caledon Forest. Then you've got the Harpy Feathers, which is a little bit more stealth as well. And then the Ash Legion Spy Kit. And this one comes from DS, uh, sorry, the Plains of Ashford. This one you buy literally right here at a tent after an event. This one's really interesting in that 
you can activate it and you just hold stealth on yourself as long as you don't use W, S, and D for a really long period of time. So this is good for getting like hero challenges and if you're just scared and you want to disengage, break combat, you can use this before going to the world map maybe or something so you don't get in combat. And there you have it. Last but not least, there are summons. So there's two classic summons. You've got the Ogre Pet Whistle. We could double click this and it will give us a random pet, okay, with a debuff here, the Ogre Pet Whistle. Or you've got the Fire Elemental Powder, which you can double click and summon a fire elemental and you'll see we get this debuff uh, you can use these together right and these will also proc with your ogre rune or whatever so now you've got a whole horde of things that take an aggro from you obviously there's an economy here and these only last five minutes and then on 30 minute cooldown so you know you got to use it at the right time you can't just wander around with tons of spawns all the time use this in a boss fight or something but uh, what a lot of people don't consider is that new patches actually still add more versions of these they overlap so because I have my fire elemental out, I can't use these two. But there are other versions. There's the pocket jade armor, who is pretty strong. And this came from the Fire Island chain uh, in Season 3. And Season 4 just added some more ones as well. The one I've got here as an example is the Sunspear Paragon supports. So this will actually summon a Sunspear that will fight with you. And it randomizes what kind of Sunspear it is, I think, as well. So don't forget about these. Use them. Put them in your inventory. They're all helpful and just make the game smooth and comfortable. And they're ways of optimizing the open world. Which is ultimately what this series is about. So there you go. You guys now know every fun toy, everything I value for the open world. A really comprehensive list. And hopefully you have the tools to now supplement what you're going to learn on the next nine videos. Or, you know, if you've already actually seen the profession video. So cheers, guys. Thanks very much. Hope you enjoyed. And until next time, take it easy.